Those of you who read the Daily News yesterday morning with the cover story, you, you know a lot about Mr. Laughlin, so I don't have to go into a lengthy introduction. I will just mention that for those who are still in remedial reading with Hal, or a little case, he went to R.A. Long High School, Lower Columbia College, and Washington State University. All right. That's his resume. He did a few other things, I mean, not that big a deal after that, but uh, <laughs> that's pretty much the key. Uh, he graduated back in the days when engineers were engineers, you know, stereotypical engineers. Uh, isn't quite the case anymore, and, and Paul was not a stereotypical engineer. He became an entrepreneur, a manager, uh, co-founder of a company, and an engineer again. But uh, he told me that they hired engineers back in those days that were, were stereotypical. And one time they hired an engineer that uh, he loved his wife so much he almost told her. <laughs> so, uh, but today, today of course, a lot of the engineers are alive. Uh, most of them have on Mars, or could be too. I'm not talking about new marriage laws either. I'm talking about gender change. What we expect. But uh, we're real honored to hear from Paul today. I'm going to move right into uh, letting him speak and get me down. He has some overhead stuff and lots of good information. And it's real exciting to have a former R.A. Long grant back, especially in these interesting times that we're having in the schools today. So please help me give a warm welcome to Paul. And remember, it is, in this case, rocket science. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I just heard George say that engineers are nerds. Is that what you heard? Yeah. We are. We are. Anyhow, um, it was fun, nerds, though. Um, I'll just get into it because I want to. I, I have been asked if there would be a question and answer period, so I'll try to whiz through this. I, I need you to understand that this is kind of a generic presentation. I've given it in lectures at Washington State University Engineering School at both of the high schools, Kelso and R.A. Long. I'm hoping to do it at Mark Morris and a number of middle schools here. And next month I'll be doing it at some elementary schools. Well, that goofy guy on the right was when I was in R.A. Long. In 1956, I graduated. The goofy guy on the left is when I retired in 2004 from my day-to-day -day activities. And my whole purpose of this is to ins try to inspire kids. And I tell them about what happened in this blank space in between. So uh, I went to LCC, loved it. What a great institution that was. I'd recommend it to anyone. Oh, incidentally, if I dated any of your daughters, when you get home, will you apologize for me? Yeah. I'd appreciate it. Uh, 1961 ME grad, Washington State University. Actually, it'd probably be your granddaughters. <laughs> <laughs> or your sisters, it was probably your sisters. Okay, uh, I, I focused on rocketry. This new world of rockets was coming up. I actually went over to Washington State University. Many of you probably uh, remember Tiz Miller. You remember Tiz? He was a real mentor to me, he and Joe Moses. And uh, Tiz had me lined up with uh, Buck Bailey, the baseball coach over there. And my brother played for the Chicago Cubs, Longview boy. And I had the opportunity and I said, I'll come do that after I'm done at Washington State. Well, I got over there and now I'm engaged to a beautiful Kelso cheerleader and have no money and found out that I couldn't get out of afternoon labs. So I had to, uh, I had to make a decision. I, I would have had to change majors to continue with baseball. And what I learned was that engineers do not have to hit curveballs. So I chose engineering. And, uh, oh, incidentally, I have a happy $10 bill, happy $10, because I noticed a Wazoo guy was the only one that put in more than a dollar at a time. <laughs> Come on, Huskies. <laughs> I, I was intrigued with my hero at the time in technology, and that was Werner von Braun. Many of you know who he is. So go ahead. He had developed a concept of a space station that looks like a big donut in the air. And what his whole concept was, and this still is probably the most advanced, best com uh, concept for a space station there is. And what it is, uh, they put a centrifugal um, rotation on that. And what does that produce? That produces gravity. So now you can walk with your feet on the, well, you're inside this thing, but with your feet on this wall, and your head towards the center of this. You, there could be multiple stories in there and everything. And then uh, it could be just like living here, you know, where we weigh just as much and so forth. 
But interestingly, the center hub right here is not spinning. There's a seal in here. And the reason it isn't is that's where you dock your spacecraft bringing supplies and people up to populate this thing. So you can walk down these spokes, which are corridors, and as you, as you uh, uh, approach the center hub, you're becoming weightless. That'd be kind of fun to do. <laughs> but this is the space station we have. Well, this is the beginning of it. There's, it's much, much larger than this photo. And the reason that we have this space station is dollars. And the reason is because in order to populate and supply this space station, it has to be completed. You can't, you can't build that a piece at a time very easily and apply the centrifugal force. So we add module after module and have uh, weightlessness in the space station. What I did, I worked for a number of companies and gradually got promoted and things. Uh, I, I went in, immediately I went into weapon systems. Uh, Russia had launched the, or Soviet Union had launched Sputnik, so we're already behind it in the space race, so they need engineers real bad in those days. Um, and uh, unfortunate reality, whether you like it or not, is that most technology advances occur if they have a military application. You understand? Everything we have in technology pretty much gets advanced if it has a military application. Ours was ICBMs, the Cold War. Uh, Minuteman, Polaris, Sprint, Peacekeeper, so on. So that's what I got involved with. But what I got to do uh, in, uh, in the development research on these things is, uh, was a lot of fun. The figure of merit for a payload to orbit is the maximum payload you can get to orbit for the minimum launch weight. And that means you want to pack as much fuel into the rocket as you can and have as little inert weight. That way you can get most of your poundage in orbit in the form of a uh, satellite. So what you do is you research and determine what that is, and that's called uh, checking up, uh, testing for limit conditions. And in rockets, the way you found limit conditions was to blow things up. So I'm a 22-year-old snot-nosed kid. I don't even know which end of the fire comes out of, and all of a sudden I'm a development engineer. And I got to blow things up, and almost blowed myself up a couple times. But what you do is uh, you, you thin down the case material as far as you can so you can pack more propellant in it until you blow it up. And you do this in subscale. And once you blow it up, you know you went too far. So you back off with a safety factor and there you are. You're at optimum conditions. And I, I, I did enough of that that I had some patent disclosures and uh, I worked for Lockheed at the time and uh, the Air Force was their customer so they just, and we did it on Air Force contracts, so all, Air Force owned all the patents, and the government doesn't have to patent anything, so that's why they're called patent disclosures and not patents. I worked on advanced composites, uh, now the 787 aircraft, you know, the Dreamliner, Boeing? That's a largely composite structure on the, on, the, um, on the fuselage. But then I got into my real love, which is uh, manned space flight. Next. This is just a brief cutaway of a, of a solid rocket motor. Those are the big white things on the side of the space shuttle. Uh, as you ladies are, know, when you bake a uh, angel food cake, you pour the batter into this, into this formed mold with what we call a mandrel in the rocket world sticking up the center of it, and you put it in the oven and bake it. But the problem with the uh, angel food cake is, or the, the advantage, frankly, is uh, that it's full of air pockets. And you can't have air pockets in solid rocket propellant. So you pour this slur slurry into this rocket case, put it in an oven, but you have to pull, do that under vacuum because air pockets in solid propellant rocket motors would cause them to blow up. Anyhow, many sections of the, oh, and, and it's ignited through this thing, the igniter up front, and the fire comes down that uh, middle core and it burns from the, from the center out. Uh, to the periphery. Anyhow, uh, these uh, solid rocket booster segments are made up of many numbers. I think there's eight on each side of these solid rocket motors. Next, please. Examples of the uh, ICBMs that uh, I worked on. Um, I was immediately, uh, again, when I didn't know which wind the fire came out, I was immediately the thrust termination engineer of the Minuteman 1 missile. And uh, that I had to learn a lot of things fast there. So I was on Minuteman. 
I was on Polaris and Poseidon, which are launched by submarines. And on the Peacekeeper, we know it as the MX missile. Next, please. An example of a liquid rocket engine, you, all, you ever wonder what's in that big orange tank that, that the shuttle rides up on? It's liquid fuel and in the form of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And uh, those are many hundreds of degrees below zero, cryogenic, because that's what keeps them in liquid form. And you have to carry oxygen up because uh, nothing burns without oxygen and space has no oxygen, so you carry your own oxygen up. And you have pressurants that, that push these things through turbo pumps that are sucking on them. And they, uh, they have atomizers which make a mist out of these. And they go into the combustion chamber and are ignited. And then the burn and the thrust comes out the nozzle. The other thing in space that needs fuel is satellites. You know, you dish TV, direct TV, GPS, and a lot of military satellites um, use this. And um, you need them because the uh, satellites always want to deorbit. Gravity of the Earth is still working on everything that's up in space. And in orbit, over a little bit over each rotation, these satellites want to decline their orbit. And uh, in order to put, have them in the right position, you, all, you now and then have to boost that satellite into orbit. So there's little thrusters in here that use fuel that pop them up into orbit. And sometimes for you pilots, Pitch yaw and roll, get screwed up up there, and you have to have little thrusters to get you back in alignment. And uh, many, most people think that the lifetime of a satellite is uh, battery life, but that's not true. Uh, solar panels here, they're always charging the batteries. The usual uh, demise of a satellite is that they run out of fuel. And um, when that happens, they're useless. And we don't go up and refuel them because it's just as cheap to send another one up on a rocket. You've got to send men up on a rocket, so why not send another satellite? Some uh, organizations, or the responsible organizations, like most U.S. ones, will uh, use the last amount of fuel they got to purposely deorbit uh, their uh, uh, satellite that's exhausted now so that it'll uh, enter the atmosphere and burn up in the atmosphere and won't become space junk but other countries don't uh, do that, or not all other countries. Uh, these are families of rockets, depending on the payload you want to put into orbit, the size of it, the perigee and apogee you want it at. Um, you know, uh, so it, there's families of launch vehicles. This is, this is one of the Boeing families, the Titan family of rockets. They also have the Atlas family. I just didn't have room on the slide for all that. This is the Lockheed uh, Delta family of missiles, and depending on your payload, you, you choose the launch vehicle that you want to put it up. Um, then there's manned space flight, and that's, that's where the fun was. I was, uh, I was in on the early stage, between Gemini and Apollo is when I came out of college. I got involved in the Apollo program to a degree, uh, but um, I'll, I'll show you an example. This is the Saturn V rocket that launched uh, the satellite. This is the crew capsule that took them to the moon. And this little pointy thing at the top, did anyone ever wonder what that pinpoint thing was? A lot of people thought it was a lightning arrester, and it probably was, but its purpose was for launch escape. It's called launch escape motor. And if this Saturn V is 40 stories tall, so if something's gonna happen down on the launch pad at ignition of the first stage, there's time to save this crew before the whole rocket blows up. And if they sense that something bad is happening, they initiate what, what's called a shape charge. Some of you'd probably know what that is. It's an explosive cut, cutting mechanism that cuts this crew capsule away from the rest of the rocket. And with the same fire switch, it ignites this little rocket. And that little rocket has canted nozzles so that the exhaust doesn't hit directly on the crew capsule. And it lifts that capsule and the crew over a couple miles and parachutes them to safety. And so that was, that was my involvement. The good news was we never needed it. So uh, I, was, I was involved in Apollo, but they never needed me. So, but still I thought, I felt as heavily involved. The big part of my life was in the space shuttle. We put man into space. We demonstrated space rendezvous. We took man to the moon. 
We did a lot of weightlessness experimentations and demonstrated long, long term space habitation. Uh, some astronauts spend a year on the space station, so the usual term is six months. So what do we do now? There's where we've been. This is the uh, Saturn V rocket with the moon, cap moon capsule at the top, 40 stories tall. Shuttle, which looks big to us and is big, I've been, I've been on it, um, is only half the, half the height of the shuttle, or of the uh, Apollo Saturn V. That's where we've been. Now these are gonna be artifacts in the museums. Here's where we're going. It's called the Space Launch System. Next, please. This one, one on the left has a little crew capsule up here, just like the uh, moon mission. We're gonna use these to go back to the moon and go to Mars. It's gonna happen. Hopefully it'll happen by the United States, but sometimes that's questionable. But anyhow, this will take the crew capsule and put it into orbit, and it'll just be sitting in orbit until this thing launches with all the support structure that takes it uh, up there to be assembled in space. It'll have the lunar lander or Mars lander. It'll have the Earth departure stage. It'll have the um, extra fuel and supply modules all attached to it. And it'll be fueled independently while in orbit. And that's what'll be used to kick it out of um, uh, capture velocity, the velocity you need to get away from Earth's gravity. Once you get to that point, you can just then drift, like the moon missions did to the moon and so forth, once the gravity of Earth is not acting on it anymore. So that's what's coming. Then what? Well, how about a space hotel? What I like to tell the kids in high school is, uh, girls, when one of these boys proposes to you, ask him where he's gonna take you on your honeymoon. How about a week of weightlessness on our honeymoon? Get a million dollars saved up and we'll go there for our honeymoon. Weightlessness on a honeymoon ought to be very intriguing, shouldn't it? The kids get that joke too. I, I don't tell it at junior highs. Anyhow, uh, here's an example, conceptual example, something that can be done if we had the resources to do it and the desire to, is an entire space colony. Imagine, if you will, a big cigar tube in space. And it might, be, um, it might be 10 or 12 football fields in diameter and uh, the length, maybe a mile in length, let's say. Well, if you think about it and, and apply a centrifugal force on that uh, periphery, you can create gravity. This is a lake down here. These are trees and fields and crops and villages and uh, maybe even cows and pigs, chickens. And, if you, and these are clouds. And if you look straight up, you'll see a lake right over the top of you. This really intrigues the kids. But you know, it's conceivable, but it's not very practical. But it gets them excited. And that's my whole purpose of this, to excite kids. Here's something that is real, or will be shortly, and this is a moon colony. And between the government and commercial uh, contractors, or, or independent commercial uh, companies, there's a lot of minerals to exploit on the moon. A lot of good stuff that's fairly easy to extract, titanium, things like that. So that will probably be the first use of a moon call in the outside of research itself, uh, exploration, will be the mining of moon, moon minerals and bringing them back to Earth. Uh, how about a Mars habitat? This is a, a rendition, one concept of Mars habitats individual uh, living quarters, support, oxygen generation systems, things like that around here. But if you extrapolate that way, way out, I asked the kids, I, I talked to a lot of science classes, what does the Mars have in its atmosphere that we already know? It has carbon dioxide. And what do trees and plants and everything green have to have to be nourished? Carbon dioxide. So if we had water and fertilizer and seeds and everything, we could go to Mars right now and plant things in the atmosphere that already exists. But it doesn't have as much oxygen. So it's conceivable that you could put domes up there, and believe me, this is being considered. 
not, not to this extent yet. There's no skyscrapers planned and things like that. But this is a, you know, extrapolation of all that information. You could have, uh, you could have a dome that has your living, living areas in. You could have a dome back here that might have uh, hospitals or something like that. Maybe over here is uh, waste, waste management, you know, sewage and things. Maybe over here is administration. They're connected by bubbles. And there's oxygen generation systems inside of this. And if we had, if there was no limit to money, resources, assets, we could terraform Mars in 100 years. It's possible. It's not practical, and it won't happen. Well, I shouldn't say that. It, it, it's, it won't happen in anything close to our lifetimes, but it's possible. That gets kids excited. I ask them, who wants to live on Mars? They raise their hands, and then I say, you'll have to resign yourself to the fact that you'll also die on Mars. So that brings a few hands down. Go ahead. So as a student, I ask them, um, what role uh, do you have in this? Does it excite you, first of all? If, if this interests you, what are you going to do about it? Does it excite you? Ask yourselves now, begin your plan. I began mine at the age of junior high. I had two passions in life, baseball and uh, rockets. And so um, I was not, I, I like to tell them I was just an average student. That surprises a lot of them. They think I must have been a valedictorian or something. I was lucky to even be in the presence of a valedictorian. So. Uh, I did the things that I just explained to you, but I did one other thing. Pretty late in life, I was 56 years old, I'm 74 now, when I co-founded a company called United Paradigm. And what we do is we fuel all of the spacecraft and satellites that contain government assets, all of those. And we do that for many of the commercial companies that uh, put uh, things into space as well. And uh, we gave the space shuttle, uh, we fueled the space shuttle, we gave the astronauts their breathing air, things like this. Pressurance was part of our business, still is. And we, and we used these uh, other liquid propellants. The uh, shuttle primary propellants are liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which are cold, but they're not, uh, they're not toxic. But the other liquid uh, propellants are, it's hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide either one of which, if you breathe, you'll die. So this guy right here is one of our employees. He's dressed in what we call a scape suit. Um, it's a, it's a isolated, it's just like a space suit, but uh, it's uh, hermetically sealed. It's got a air breathing backpack on it, just like the guys on the moon had. And uh, that's what they have to use when they're transferring these propellants. The, this is a nitrogen tetroxide storage tank into which some of our fellows are right here. Are, uh, are, are putting into this trailer. And this trailer will take it out to a launch site and fuel a launch vehicle. Go ahead. In that business, uh, the career path of our employees was largely out of military fuels, because that's where rockets started. And uh, in that career path, they also did a lot of flight line fueling. So we got into that, and we're, we're doing a lot of flight line fueling at military bases around the world. And that's all part of the military supply system, so we got into supply and logistics, too. Well, we did all that, and you do all that, and you have fun doing it, and finally, something nice happens. In uh, 2003, where my uh, beautiful wife and I were celebrating about our 47th anniversary, she was a beautiful cheerleader from Kelso. Did I tell you that? Yeah. Okay, I can't say enough about that. Anyhow, we were invited to the, uh, Smith the dedication of the new Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. They outgrew the one on the wall, in, uh, on the mall in Washington. So uh, they built a new one out at Chantilly, Virginia by Dulles Airport. We were invited to the dedication. Very high security because 9-11 had happened just a couple years earlier. Well, we were escorted through the whole affair and, and with a lot of dignitaries and a lot of the original astronauts, some of whom are my friends, and it was nice. As we were escorted out the front door, there was a wall of honor, and I found my name uh, engraved in the wall of honor. That was quite a nice, nice event. <coughs> so this is how I end with the kids. Uh, I suggest if this, if you're interested, and I don't care if you're an artist, a musician, a history major, English, or you want to be involved in rockets or, or aircraft, whatever. 
Find your passion. Don't spend your whole life doing something you don't like. Enjoy what you do. But find that passion, focus on it, and strive to excel in it. You have to recognize every endeavor has a budget. Your boss may be dumb, he may not take your idea or something, but you gotta recognize he's got a budget. And that might be in dollars or time or the, the physical assets you can use. Integrity is paramount. I, I use as an example, regardless of how you feel about man-caused climate change, the uh, repository of all the international data on that is the East Anglia University in the United Kingdom. And their responsibility was to acquire this data and then uh, distribute it to anyone in the field that wanted to get it and, um, you know, just keep, a, keep their handle on it. Well, what we found was, through emails that some people found, they uh, destroyed evidence that refuted their preconceived conclusion. And in doing so, they damaged their own idea. And then they demonized the scientists that wanted them to include that again. So what it did was damage the conclusion they had already come to. Do. Data is data. It can be manipulated. Then finally, when, you're, uh, when you've done good things, you know, just stay humble. Stay humble. You're just another person on this planet. And I added one more to this that got a headline in the paper, if you saw it, and that's attitude. I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're cleaning toilets. Be the best toilet cleaner there can be. I, I, got, I drove up, and I went through Grants Pass, and I stopped at Fred Meyer and got gas. And, and down there, you know, they have to gas your cars for you in Oregon. And there was this kid just running around, taking it with a smile on his face and everything. And I said, you know, keep your attitude. That attitude's gonna make you successful. And you know, when I drove out, he ran after me. And he said, sir, you just made my day. Well, that kid will remember that. And that's what I try to tell kids to remember. Your attitude's everything. I don't care if you're pumping gas, um, uh, feeding me fries, or sending man to the moon. Your attitude is what'll make you successful. Oh. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll enjoy some. <laughs> that's called attitude adjustment. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.